My name's Kenny Bustani. I'm a Spring Developer Advocate at Pivotal. Um, Prithpal? Good morning, guys. Uh, Prithpal Bogel. I'm part of the Apigee product team within the Google Cloud platform. Uh, today we're going to be talking to you about uh, managing the complexity of microservice deployments. Um, well, that name's a little vague, but we're going to cover uh, using uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry and Apigee together to build a microservice architecture. And so I'm gonna start out by just reviewing the architecture of what we're going to be demoing later. And then Prithpal's gonna come back up and he's gonna demo you the functionality. All right, so uh, our agenda is, uh, I'm gonna talk about going from a monolith to a microservice. Uh, then we're gonna answer the question of why API management. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the Apigee and Pivotal partnership and uh, integration and uh, customer benefits key takeaways. All right, so we started with this. This is the monolithic application. You're all probably very familiar with this kind of architecture. Now, in the middle here, I have in green a war deployment. Now this is on Apache Tomcat, our application server. And inside of that artifact, we have our really our compiled code now this code base has different modules in it. We have a storefront UI, accounting service, inventory service, and a shipping service. And in the back end we have one large relational database. Now the main problem with this model is that it's going to slow us down considerably. And this causes a bunch of issues, right? So as you go to microservices, you, it's good to understand why we're going there by looking at this architecture. Now the first thing is it's going to slow our velocity going into production, right? And that's because we have all of these developers. Maybe we have a thousand developers in the organization who are all sharing the same code base, right? So if one developer changes one line of code, it means that uh, the entire application has to be deployed into production to operationalize that change. And so that causes the fundamental issue is that developers aren't able to go at their own speed uh, because they have to worry about everything else going on in that code base as well as the people who are changing it in parallel. It also takes way too long to ramp up new engineers, right? So if the business thinks that it's as simple as just adding more engineers to a project to go faster, then they're gonna be very wrong eventually because that code base really just keeps on growing and growing and growing and the complexity keeps on growing. And so developers have to take a while to learn that code base to really understand how to change it without introducing risk into production. Uh, with microservices, we've split up that functionality into many small services that are easier to comprehend. Uh, so for microservices, it's not really about the lines of code as it is how long does it take an engineer to ramp up and learn that code base before they can actually deploy a feature into production. Uh, now, this is fundamental to uh, the problem of uh, the monolithic application is that all of our developers, everyone in the organization is gonna be sharing that infrastructure, right? Um, so if everyone's sharing that same infrastructure, there's gonna be a lot of competition. Uh, there's gonna need to be a lot of coordination to make sure that things don't go wrong. Now with microservices, you move into a self-service model. And the idea there is that your developers are going to be able to use a platform to be able to provision their infrastructure for their application. And they'll be provided with services that will connect together these applications and microservices, things like uh, API management with Apigee. But more than anything, it's just one thing, right? It's deploy everything at once or nothing at all, and that's why the monolithic application has become so hard to, to manage, so hard to change over time. And we got a little bit better. We moved to the SOA before microservices, and we learned that sharing infrastructure is a bad idea. And so in this example here, I have three separate applications. I have an accounting service, inventory service, and a shipping service. And so we've split out that large monolithic application deployment now into three separate deployment pipelines. So now there are three ways for changes to get into production, right? Um, now, this should probably be smaller. We should probably have maybe 10, 20 microservices and our teams working in parallel, all deploying their changes into production. But with the SOA, what became the problem was that we were still sharing something. We were sharing libraries, right? So sharing anything is kind of a bad idea if it causes people to have conflict. And so down at the bottom, I have my domain language. I have my domain objects, the customer record, account record, address record, and so on. Now, over time, the ownership of these objects becomes blurred. Uh, the teams really don't know who owns what. 
uh, but they do have to still implement features. And when a feature requires changing one of these domain objects, uh, they're going to have to worry about other applications breaking because they need to have the same version of that object. And so for the customer and account record, if I make a change there, then I can just deploy the accounting service. But what happens when I make a change to the address record? Uh, now I have to worry about upgrading three separate applications, and then I need to have a coordinated deployment of three separate applications at the same time. And then if something goes wrong, I have to deploy all three of these applications back. Now this is the problem with SOA, is that at first it seems like a very good idea, but over time it becomes very difficult to manage. Uh, you actually get even worse than a monolith, you get something like a distributed monolith. And so we learned a few things there and we got a little bit better again and now we've arrived at microservices. And this is all about these small teams, you all know what microservices are today. Uh, we have small teams, uh, maybe anywhere from eight to 12 developers, who are working on one small application that's focused on doing one thing well, right? And these uh, applications are organized around business capability, not so much around functionality. Uh, and that's key, that is that from the front end to the back end, We'll have features that focus on a part of the domain. Maybe we have one product manager who's working on one part of the domain, and those features are gonna funnel back into the microservice architecture, and we'll look at that a little bit later. But fundamental to this is that we're not gonna share things, right? Uh, so here in this diagram, I have five separate microservices. I have a user service, movie, recommendation, rating, and analysis. And these five separate applications represent five different ways for changes to get into production, right? So we have a small team of developers on each one of these applications, and they're able to deploy changes in parallel. Uh, now they're also able to expose APIs to other services to implement a feature, and this is key to a microservice architecture. We have a lot more APIs. Now we wanna make sure that our developers in the front end don't have to worry about the complexity of maybe 500 separate APIs and applications. We want that to be seamless. We wanna have one API contract that all of the front end developers, all of the other microservice developers uh, can use without having to worry about where to go. And to do this, you really need to have self-service on-demand infrastructure, right? So as your microservice architecture grows, as you get into 200 microservices or more, which could happen in 10 years, uh, you, need to worry, you need to worry about not doing manual work, right? You have to give developers a way to self-service, uh, to be able to provision infrastructure, to be able to use services to connect applications together. You have to make it easy, or else you're gonna run into the same problem that you had with the SOA. Uh, so let's look at an example architecture here. I have uh, an online store uh, that I put together, and uh, this is a real application. It's open source if you're interested. I'm not gonna go through the demo today because we don't have enough time, uh, but I'm gonna explain the architecture and tell you why you need API management. Now up at the top, I have my front end application. I have the online store. Now this is going to be just a simple uh, application, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, it use, uses AngularJS, and uh, these front-end developers aren't going to worry about creating back-end code. Uh, they're going to use an API, right? And they're going to need to go through this middle layer here, which represents platform services, to be able to communicate with the microservices there in the back-end. And so at the very bottom here, I actually have my microservices. I have the catalog service, the account service, inventory, shopping cart, and an order service. Now, each one of these applications has an API that it exposes, but to access that API, our developers in the front end shouldn't have to worry about the implement implementation details of each one of these applications. They should be able to go through an API gateway. Now, there in the middle, I have my platform services, and these are the things that I'm going to be able to provision to help me connect to applications in the back end, so I don't have to worry about where things are located. That red application in the center, that's an API gateway, and it's using Apigee Edge. Now, from the front end, all I have to do is worry about one contract of all of these services in the back end, and as they grow, that contract just grows and grows, but it's seamless. There's not this disconnection between these separate applications and their APIs. I'm able to go through one API gateway and manage everything centrally from there. Now I have other things here. I have my user service, which helps me with authentication. 
I have a discovery service and a config server, and you may have many more services in this layer, um, but today we're just gonna focus on that red one. And so here you can see that from the front end application, uh, developers will just contact one app, the API gateway, and that will have the contract of the catalog service, the account service, inventory, shopping cart, and order service. And I'll just reverse proxy through there. That means that I'll contact an endpoint in that API gateway. It's going to reverse proxy to that backend service, which corresponds to a particular route, like forward slash catalog or forward slash account, and then return a response from that application. All in parallel, you'll have developers who are deploying their changes, right, in parallel, not having to worry about breaking changes, and the front-end developers will just worry about their part of the puzzle, which is just that API gateway. Now let's talk about going from monolith to microservice, right, because uh, that's the main challenge today for many companies. We're not all building greenfield applications. We have to worry about brownfield, and there's some things to be, uh, worried about in this uh, process. Uh, so there are two popular ways to do this. The first way is splitting the monolith. And with splitting the monolith, the idea is that you'll take your monolithic application and you'll split it, you'll slice it into different microservices and then you'll connect everything together. Um, that makes a lot of sense because you've already written a lot of code, why would you go and create more code? Uh, but what happens over time is you have to worry about a few things. You have to worry about API management, uh, but primarily you have to worry about the back end. And this is a very simple example. I have a customer service application that's connected to one customer database, and then I have three separate tables there. Now, the part where you have to be worried about is that it's not all about the application, right? So if I wanted to split out something from the customer service to refactor that as a separate application, I'm also going to have to worry about separating out the data in the database, and then you're gonna have more things to worry about like a data warehouse, right? So all of those jobs that are running back and forth from third-party systems, you also have to worry about that. Now, if you do go forward with this, uh, you might uh, have something that looks like this. So this is the first step after. Uh, so I'll, I'll split out the user service here, which used to sit inside of the customer application, and then I'm going to migrate out the user table from the customer DB and put that into a new database, because each microservice should have its own database. It should not be sharing a database. And when you do this, uh, you'll have to bring down that database, right? You'll have to bring down the customer database to run this migration. And so if you do this 500 times, you're gonna have a lot of maintenance windows, right? And that's gonna introduce a lot of risk. And so there's a lot of risk that comes with splitting the monolith and uh, what most people who say at conferences who have been successful with this model is that it was very, very painful and it took a lot of time, which is really all software development, but this took a lot longer than that. But there's a better way, there's hope. Uh, if you've uh, heard of this pattern, who's heard of the strangler pattern? Now this is a very, very popular approach today because it allows you to start building microservices right away with your new features, so you get all of the benefits of microservices, but you reach back into that monolithic application, uh, you actually extract data from there, and over time, you're able to move that data into your microservices. Now a little bit of history here, uh, this pattern was first, uh, I guess, created by Martin Fowler, and he went to Australia around 2001, 2002 on a vacation, and he saw this tree, and this is called a strangler vine. And he said, this looks like a great way to strangle my legacy software. And uh, what he described was this. He says, uh, we're gonna gradually create a new system around the edges of the old, letting it grow slowly over several years until the old system is eventually strangled. Now, he created this in 2002. I don't think microservices existed back then, uh, but it was a way for you to take uh, your legacy system and start to modernize it. So the question today is, how do we apply this to microservices? And it really depends on your architecture, right? So you might be a monolith, you might be an SOA, or you might be something in between that, and it really will depend on what your architecture looks like. Now, not all of the architectures that are going to microservices are monoliths, right? A lot of them are SOAs or web services. In this example, I have an SOA. And the challenge is really going to be uh, actually replacing these services over time that are legacy and hard to change with microservices. And you might have the dreaded ESB, which kind of centralizes everything in the SOA and makes it hard to change. But 
you also have this large database in the back end that has all your customer data. And so if you're gonna build new microservices, you need a way to reach into this back end uh, to be able to get records. And so it's kind of small up here, but what you're gonna do next is you're going to build an API gateway essentially, which is going to broker communication between your new microservices and that back end. And over time, what you're gonna do is you're going to extract out data from that legacy system, and you're going to import it into your microservice databases. And so you'll be able to take control of that data by transferring the ownership of the system of record to these individual microservices. And so you can use an API gateway to do this. Now how it'll work is that this legacy edge adapter uh, will allow you to communicate with these backend web services, and you'll be able to route, depending on the record, to either a microservice or to a legacy service. So for example, if I have a profile microservice, it's going to take control over the data that's in the customer service over time. And kind of like a caching pattern, uh, when you request that data from the front end, let's say I get an individual customer record, I'm gonna check whether it's in my microservice database. If it's not there, then I can go to that backend system, retrieve it from there, and create a migration for an individual record. Now when I do that over five years, I'm slowly transferring data ownership from that backend system into my new microservices. And so this allows me to reason about what's the impact or risk to the business if I get rid of that legacy system. Now if you go to the business today and say, well, I'm gonna do the splitting the monolith approach, 100% of our users are gonna be impacted and we're gonna have maintenance windows for the next 20 years. Uh, they're probably gonna say, no, that's crazy, right? I mean, that's not enough benefit for the amount of risk that we have. And in some domains, that's uh, more important than others. Uh, but the idea here is that it's going to allow you to reason about an actual migration without bringing the system down. And so you migrate data away from a large shared database over time using this API gateway. And this allows you to start building features today, brand new features, without having to worry about changing that legacy system. And that's really what we all want. Now, using a platform, it's gonna make this a lot easier. And so we have PCF, Pivotal Cloud Foundry, and our integration with Apigee, which is going to allow you, as a large organization, uh, to be able to centrally manage that API, which is very important. Uh, now, I'm sure that you all know about PCF today. Um, but I'm gonna bring Prith Paul up on stage now and he's going to uh, walk you through how this all works. Yeah. Awesome, so just a quick show of hands. Uh, how many developers in the audience today? All right, quite a bit. So how many out here think microservices and APIs are different yet complementary? Okay, all right, well, we'll see if we can change that a little bit today. All right, so Kenny walked you through, you know, different patterns on how customers are becoming successful, uh, you know, with microservices. What I'm here to talk about is more around, great, now you have microservices, but how does that really tie into the world of APIs? So the question is why API management? Microservices versus APIs have a pretty unique relationship. So I'm going to just touch on a few different examples here. In this case, think about orders as being one of the microservices uh, that you have written. That tends to be an architecture style. You know, many customers are modernizing apps, so now hopefully some have taken on the microservices strategy and now are building microservices. So microservice by itself is an architecture style. It's an approach, but it's also your backend. That's where all the business logic lives in. At some point in time, that microservice has to be exposed. Now, a lot of this will depend on the landscape where your microservice participates in. What do I mean by that? In some cases, you're refactoring code into microservices, and it's only available or used within the department or within your team. As it starts to move up in the value chain, so which means as that microservice now starts to be used across the team, across the department, and eventually across the enterprise boundary, hopefully by customers and partners, it becomes a contract. It becomes something which you have to maintain. So that is where the API comes in. So the slash v1 slash orders is not only a technical HTTP or DNS name to that 
microservice is actually a contract. That's the front end which you're sharing with your customers and partners to enable different kinds of applications. So in that sense, APIs and microservices are complementary. Not all microservices are going to be exposed as APIs. And when I say that, of course every microservice in the new modern style of development will have an HTTP endpoint which is going to be used. But is that endpoint something which is available as a contract to a customer or partner who's trying to build an app is a completely different thing. You may do microservices as a strategy for a lot of different kinds of very, very well-established benefits, such as developer productivity, a lot of reuse, time to market to software, right? So as you start to evolve and uh, modernize your infrastructure and your architecture, you will start to see that APIs kind of become that layer which will start to shield customers from microservices complexity. This is a very important point. The reality is, as many enterprises are on this journey to modernize their infrastructure, business as usual has to go on, right? Sure, you're trying to migrate away from legacy infrastructure, but that legacy infrastructure is still supporting a lot of existing business. There is a transitionary phase, so we'll come back and touch on that in a few as to why that becomes important. But APIs as a layer now shields you from microservices complexity. As the strangling the monolith pattern, uh, which was shared by Kenny, there's gonna be a period of time when you start to slowly decompose things and build them out, right? API becomes that layer which will shield you from how you're running your shop at that time. Once you have a microservice which is exposed as an API, potentially used across the enterprise or through your partner as an app, just like a microservice has a life cycle, an API has a life cycle. Why is this important? It is important because you need to be able to understand the different aspects of what goes in in the API life cycle. Let's quickly examine that. So it starts by design. Many days, uh, you know, they were bottom-up approaches which customers took where they could just have a plethora of different kinds of services which they were converted, converting into APIs. But these days, people are using Open API or Swagger, as it used to be known before, as a design tool, right? So you need to be able to have the design in place to be able to author the API. Once you design the API and you start putting some business logic in it or building it, you need to have the platform support those aspects. But it doesn't really stop there. Once you start building an API, then you need to be able to put in the right kinds of policies to secure it. One of the most common requirements that we get always is, great, I have a lot of these microservices, but I need to secure all of them, especially the ones which are exposed externally as APIs. We want to secure them using OAuth, right? Once you have security in place, the biggest point of ensuring that there is adoption and use of your microservices or your APIs is effectively through publishing it on a developer portal, right? So you see how the kind, cycle kind of goes through. Once it's in place, you need to monitor, make sure you're getting the right kind of response time, latencies, performance, et cetera. Analyze, see if there's actually being adoption of those kind of APIs. So this API life cycle is something which is very tangible, something which most customers can experience. And in order to provide the full life cycle support, Apigee's API platform comes into, uh, comes into the picture. So Apigee, is, Apigee Edge is a full-blown API platform. Uh, it's available completely in the cloud, or it can also be used on premises. And we've had hybrid deployment topologies for the last couple of years, right? In response, in reaction to the upcoming microservices uh, movement. So think about the Apigee API platform in four high-level buckets. So on the top, you see out here, you have the management tier, which includes the analytics capabilities. This is the end-to-end -end visibility into what's happening with the APIs, who are using them. Are some APIs getting used more than the others? The developer portal now talks about the thing which I was mentioning earlier. Where are the app developers? These are not the app developers who are building apps or not the API developers who are you know, configuring the APIs. These are the consumers 
your partner developers, your customers developers who are really trying to build apps against those APIs and essentially microservices. The management plane gives you the ability for the API developers who now want to secure your microservices. You can go in and play around with different kinds of ways to you know, add policies, uh, put different kinds of aspects to it. And then you have the API gateway, right? So the API gateway is the heart of the API platform. That is where all the traffic, API traffic processing happens. With that, the API gateway has you know, been used, distributed across different kinds of uh, environments. And the full-blown API gateway uh, that Apigee has, it had about 30 different out-of-the-box policies to do things like security, traffic management, uh, extension, and then you know, doing orchestration, et cetera. But then about two years back, we've had uh, a version that we rolled out called the Apigee Micro Gateway. And that has been out there for about a couple of years. We have a lot of customers using it. That was a purpose-built gateway with a very, very small footprint. It's built on uh, Node.js. And that is used primarily to be able to provide lightweight API management for microservices. Okay, so we'll talk about that a little bit and we'll show you a demo as to how that works. So that's the Apigee API platform, a family of federated gateways with you know, these capabilities available completely in the cloud, completely on premises, so you can take the exact same software, deploy it and run it, or you can do it in a hybrid uh, style. So we spoke about the two different gateways. We'll actually get into uh, showcasing some of the capabilities of how these things work together. So Pivotal and Apigee have been partnered together uh, for the last couple of years. And uh, we've done a lot of work together, and today I'll be touching on some of the integrations that we have built to make it super easy for our joint customers to work with the two platforms. So let's talk about the first one. We see many of our uh, on-premises customers. So as, as I mentioned, Apigee can be used in the cloud, or customers can take the exact same software that we run into the SaaS service, take the exact same multi-tenant platform, deploy it within the data centers. For many of those customers, and especially customers who are deploying Pivotal uh, or are, uh, leveraging Pivotal in their own private cloud, they can actually take the Apigee Edge installer, which works with Bosch, and then deploy it, deploy Apigee Edge through Bosch in the data centers, right? So this is an integration which is really useful for the operators. What we have come to see is many operators uh, start you know, liking Bosch for what it does, right? The self-healing, the management, maintenance, unification of release engineering, et cetera, all those things, all that goodness of Bosch can then be leveraged for the Apigee Edge installer, right? So through Bosch, as a tile, through the ops manager, you can actually deploy Apigee Edge, and then Bosch can manage that for you, okay? So that's the first integration. Then. Let's talk a little bit about the service broker, which is the one that we're going to be demonstrating today. So we have three different flavors of integrations which have been delivered through the service broker. The first one, which was released about a year and a half back, is to the very left. In this case, it leverages the route services capabilities of the Pivotal Cloud Foundry platform. And using those constructs, think about you being an app developer and pushing your app, right? Once the Apigee service broker is installed and configured, you essentially can use bind route services command, and at that point in time, using the right kind of Apigee org, which is uh, the way we do multi-tenancy, and the Apigee environment within the org, you will automatically create an API proxy. An API proxy is nothing but think of that as a, a pipeline, right? Think of that as a place where you can drop in different kinds of policies. Let's say you want to secure an API call using OAuth. You may drop in the OAuth policy, right? You may drop in a spike arrest policy, so on and so forth. So that API proxy gets automatically generated, and it gets associated with the routing table of that particular Cloud Foundry app that you've just pushed, right? So just by running a few commands, you pushed your app, you've now automatically created an API proxy, which during runtime, whenever a call comes into 
the cloud friendly platform asking for that app, the request goes to Apigee Edge, right? Where it can implement any of the policy that you've configured. And once it passes through those checks, it'll go back to the app, right? So this is a great way of automatically inserting API management into the app. So that was the first integration we had released through the service broker. Shifting the focus a little bit more towards microservices. So the Apigee Edge micro gateway, as I mentioned, is a purpose-built gateway which is suitable for microservices. The footprint is so small that it can actually reside actually on the host server where the app is running, or it can also be used as a proxy model. So the second style of integration which is out there still leverages the route services, but gives you the ability to now have the Apigee micro gateway deployed as a CF app by itself, right? So all the proxying and enforcement of different kinds of policies happen out there. Now remember, micro gateway, as the name suggests, A is a smaller gateway, and it also does subset of some of the capabilities of the bigger gateway. So the bigger gateway, the enterprise gateway, has over 30 different uh, out-of-the-box policies to do a variety of different kinds of stuff. The way you work with the enterprise gateway is through XML descriptor languages, right? You have certain message flows that you configure, you add certain policies. The micro gateway provides you capabilities to do things like spike arrest, you can enforce quotas or subscription quotas for your APIs, you can do things like API key validation, OAuth, and it also pushes analytics asynchronously up to the Apigee Edge analytics plane, right? The development style of uh, configuring Apigee micro gateway is through a YAML file. So you just pretty much specify what policies you want, deploy it, and then all the enforcement happens locally. So that's the second style of integration. The third one, which is what we're going to be looking at today, and we are just announcing uh, as we are in the session, the availability of uh, beta uh, 3.0 service broker, which includes the newest style of integration. So let me talk a little bit about that. So in this pattern, we, we have toyed around with this for a while. How do we really make it extremely seamless for the app developers to insert API management? And also for low latency use cases, especially where you want to eliminate the hop which is introduced by route services, we have come up with a deployment style where the Apigee micro gateway can be co-resident inside of the app container as a sidecar proxy, okay? So this is the one that we'll touch on today. Obviously, it has a few different benefits, some of which we just went through, but we'll take a live look at this and delve deeper into how this integration works. So here is the, the demo that I'm going to walk you through. Let me give you a very, very high-level context on what we are going to show you so you can follow along. So I have a very simple app, uh, which we'll call it SP1 2017 Protected, for lack of a better name. Uh, this is just a nomenclature to show that this app is actually going to be managed and protected using some protection policies, okay? So we'll work through the logistics here, but essentially I'll push that app right into Cloud Foundry, and we will use the, the decorator build pack. In this integration style, the Apigee micro gateway is delivered as a decorator build pack. This leverages the meta build pack, and we'll show you how the ordering happens, but essentially, at the end of the day, when you're done pushing this app, you bind it and you start it, Apigee micro gateway gets inserted into the app container, and then it starts intercepting the calls and applying all the policy that you've applied to it, okay? And it starts providing API management for the underlying microservice. So we'll look at that. Asynchronously, Apigee Edge, the micro gateway communicates with the Apigee Edge in the cloud, where you can see all the useful analytics on what kind of traffic is being, uh, you know, peppered up towards that microservice, right? Are there any kind of latency aspects to it, response time, et cetera? So that is automatically provided for by the platform, okay? So let's take a look. Let's make sure the demo gods are with us. 
Okay, seems like the internet is working. All right, so let me start from just flashing out the service broker and that you can get it today from PivNet. So I'll just blow this thing up a little bit so you guys can see it. So this is available uh, as of this morning. You can download this from PivNet. So the first component of this is the Ops Manager. How does this thing gets deployed? So you can see the Apigee tile. This may be very, very uh, synonymous to many folks who have probably been working with the uh, platform for some time. So Apigee Edge uh, Service Broker is delivered as a tile. And you can, you know, I'm not going to go through the entire thing, but there are certain semantics on configuring the tile. You go in and specify some of those constructs here. In this case, there are certain, so Apigee Edge is a multi-tenant platform, which means you can configure multiple orgs, which represents one tenant, or it could, for a bigger enterprise, represent one big business unit. You can configure many of them. Out here, the operator will go and specify which orgs are going to be used uh, by the, within the foundation. Okay, so you can see the default configuration here, the APGH org name, I'll blow this thing up a little bit more, the environment that you're going to use. Apigee is also an API first platform, which means, yes, you can do a lot of things from the user interface, but you can also work with it using APIs. So all those things are specified out here. There's some build pack settings, especially around the, the ordering. So again, you know, this is a one-time configuration which will be done by the, by the operators when they're setting this thing up. So you can see the ordering of the, the micro gateway decorator build pack. Awesome, so this is the configuration of the tile. So now let's go into, i log into Cloud Foundry here. Question? Yes. Uh, these orgs are different from the PC of uh, They are, they are. These are the Apigee Edge orgs. So within the Apigee Edge platform, you will create one or more orgs to represent your business unit, or if one org is enough from an enterprise perspective, that'd be one org. And within an org, you can have different environments. So think about org as an administrative unit. Any API proxy that you build and develop, any API keys that you generate to enforce security, any kind of grouping of API that you make as API products, all of that is contained within an org. So if I'm using this org, I may not need the PC of org? No, no, no. So you would still need your PC of org. You, so think about your role as twofold. You are a Cloud Foundry app developer, so you are going to be connected to the Cloud Foundry org and space, right? Whatever it's been set up for you. But this is the org and environment within the Apigee Edge platform. Exactly, right? Sure, and we'll, we'll get into more Q&A towards the end as well. So let's, so I ran CS services. I'm assuming everyone in the back can see it. I can move this a little bit here. Okay, so these are the different kinds of uh, services which are available today. Oops. Right, live demo. Okay, just give it a second while I log back in here. I'm pretty sure the internet is working. Just taking a few seconds here. There you go, okay, getting there. Come on. I'll try it one more time, give me one second here. Okay, let's try this thing one more time here. All right. 
So let's go into space where the app is. Okay. So let's now very quickly examine a few things. I think I should still be connected. Okay. So you can see all the different services, uh, the service instances. In this case, I spoke about the three integrations. The org plan represents the first one. Uh, the micro gateway represents the second cell of integration. So org and micro gateway using route services. And the last one, the one on the top here, the micro gateway co-resident is a plan that we're going to actually walk through today. Okay. So now just imagine for a second the experience of the app developer, right? That's one of the things we have really tried to optimize uh, in this case for this particular uh, integration style. So if I'm an app developer, this looks like a very, very simple uh, structure of an app within Cloud Foundry. It's a very simple app which really just spits out CF you know, hello from the CF app, right? Just to demonstrate the use case out here. Let's take a look at the manifest. So one of the things that you would, as an app developer, specify is how exactly do I want the micro gateway to manage the underlying microservice, right? And when I say manage, do I want to secure it? Do I want to provide any kind of... Uh, you know, rate limiting, et cetera. I'll just switch to this tab here. You can see the different kinds of, and this is available on the Apigee micro gateway documentation. The different plugins that you see out here, these are the ones which are supported by the micro gateway, right? So you can do things like OOP, you can do things like Cora, SpikeRest, which is nothing but simple system level rate limiting. Analytics is automatically enabled, which means as you're working with the microservices, the data is getting pushed to uh, Apigee Edge. And you can see a bunch of other plugins that we have developed. The point is, the micro gateway architecture is super extensible, which means if there is a plugin which doesn't really fit your bill, you can actually go extend it, okay? All right, so let's get back to this out here. So in this case, you can see a few different things I'll just call out. So using the environment variables within your app manifest, you will specify certain key things which are required for the micro gateway. In this case, you will specify where the config directory is. This is where it picks up the information on what to enforce. You can develop custom plugins, in which case you would specify them out here. And then out here, you start specifying which policies you want to enforce. So in this case, as a very quick example, I've highlighted the OAuth policy and how you can set up and put in different kinds of attributes to it. This is how you would start configuring some of those policies. And in the last one, we say sequence, we have applied spike arrest, okay? And we are saying out here, allow 10 requests per minute. So think about, you know, one, about six requests every 10 seconds or so, roughly, right? Or somewhere around that. So it'll try to just spread that out across that time frame. Okay, so this is the app manifest. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a token. And this token is nothing but me trying to get a bearer token to connect to Apigee Edge. Okay. And let's enter this code here. Great. So at this point in time, I've just went through and authenticated with Apigee Edge. I have a bearer token, which is going to be needed by this particular app. All right, so now let's go quickly see some of the apps out here. You can see we have one app, SP1 uh, 2017 sample. And this is a very simple app without any kind of protection on it. So if we, uh, sure. So your question is, the API tile was there in the ops manager. Are those services available in each and every org? Yeah. yeah, so you would go through the traditional instantiation as you would in Cloud Foundry, make that available in your organ spaces, 
right? So you would go in a CF marketplace, create an instance of the service just like you would any other service. Right. Correct. Correct. Well, so the orgs that we specify in the tile are Apigee Edge orgs. Well, so yeah, exactly. And the reason we do that is because you don't want all the app developers just connecting to any random Apigee instances. That tile and that second wizard out there says, which Apigee Edge orgs can that app bind to? Which Cloud Foundry apps can connect to which Apigee Edge orgs? So as an example, let's say in your, in your deployment, you may have two Apigee Edge orgs that you're using, right? And so you want to control which orgs the developers are connecting to. You don't want them connected to random Apigee Edge instances and orgs anywhere in the planet. That's what that setting is for. No, so think about the Apigee Edge org, or one or two or n orgs that you create out there, as their its own individual scalable cloud, if you would. All you're doing by doing that is saying, how many Apigee Edge orgs do I want my developers to connect to? But it scales automatically. We can get more into that. Yep. Sure, so for denial of service, sure, that's a very, very valid point. But let's say your requirement is, I want to enforce OAuth for all my APIs. Right, and then let's say you want to enforce business level quota on your APIs, which means I have a partner, and you may have three tiers of partners, you know, silver, gold, platinum, and some may be expected to use it 10 times a minute, some could use it 1,000 times a minute. Yeah, so you can use the proxy model for that. The second style of integration, you can apply it, and this is business quota, so not a technical quota of how much can the app scale, but you're only allowed to make 10 API calls a minute. Let's say that's the business contract we enforce, which you can actually plug into Apigee. It will also enforce that. Exactly, exactly, on the consumption side. Okay, all right, so let's get going with this. This is a sample app which is out there, and if I run it a few times, you know, this is an unprotected app, if you would, right? And just the exact same app just returns hello from CF app. You can see the URL, SP12017, and this is the sample app, right? Great, so that's the app which is deployed out there, but this is not the app we're going to actually walk through. We're going to walk through the app that we're going to create right now. To do that, I will do a CF push and no start. So at this point in time, I have uploaded the app bits over to Cloud Foundry, right? This should be very, very simple. Great. The second thing I'm going to do, and I'm going to just copy the command from here, I'm going to do a bind service command, right? So you saw the co-resident service, which is nothing but a service which uh, caters to the micro-gateway co-resident plan, right? So in this case, let's walk through this real quick. So bind this app, SP1 2017 protected, right? Use the co-resident plan. You have the APGH org details, the environment details, the bearer token that we have just created. And you can in the action specify bind. It could be proxy or it could be proxy and bind. What does that mean? If you, if you issue a proxy and a bind action, it will actually go create a brand new Apigee API proxy and then also bind the app to that. In this case, I've already, in the previous step, configured the proxy. So in this case, I'm only binding to it. So you can control what you want out there. You specify the target endpoint. In this case, the target endpoint is nothing but the actual uh, fully qualified domain name service of your app, right? So SP1 2017 protected, yada, yada, yada. And then you specify two Three, uh, three critical inf pieces of information. The first is the APG Edge micro key and the secret. This is what is used to securely communicate 
Well, Apigee Micro Gateway uses this to securely communicate with Apigee Edge, right? To download some information, such as you want to uh, specify and enforce some Quora, it will be able to download all that information and also establishes a secret channel, a secure channel to be able to push analytics, okay? And the target app port. So in this case, because Micro Gateway sits as a, as a sidecar, it will intercept all calls. So that's the component which will sit on at 8080. And then you can specify your actual app. In this case, we just chose the port as 8081, okay? So these are a few of the details you specify out here. And you run the bind service command. So it looks like that went through okay. So I'm going to do the last thing, which is start this app. So as I do this, you can see that because we're using the meta build pack, uh, you saw the declarator build pack, it just flew through it. it it's introspecting that. And it's now picking up some of the information which was passed during the bind process, right? It's using that through the, uh, through the variables, through the environment variables. And at this point in time, it is configuring the APGH micro gateway and is now going to enforce the policies. It's establishing the order in the process, uh, process flow, and now it's going to be listening in for those kind of requests. Now while this is happening, I'm going to very quickly go over here let me just run this and make sure it works and hasn't timed out. Okay, so this is the APG Edge uh, management console. This is what a traditional API developer would use to go create API proxies, right? An API proxy, as I mentioned, is nothing but uh, a pipeline where you can add different kinds of policies. I'll just quickly show you a very simple uh, Proxy. Let me just pick up an existing one. So let's say here's an employee's proxy. I'm just showing you how the the uh, the main gateway looks like and how you author policies out there. So within this uh, API uh, proxy, you can go out here and add a lot of different kinds of policies. These were the 30 different policies I was talking about, right? You can do traffic management, quota, caching, etc security, bunch of things. We're not gonna go through all of this. But again, all of this is available in the enterprise gateway, okay? Completely in the cloud or on-premises. Awesome, let's get back to our proxy, which is pertinent to the app that we just pushed out there. So this is the proxy which gets generated uh, as part of uh, the bind process, right? If you do an action of proxy and bind, it will actually go and create this API proxy. In this case, you can see that the URL uh, is the URL that you're going to show. So this is the API contract that I was talking about. This is the URL which is used by the platform to provide these kind of capabilities. And then the local host 8081 in this case indicates to the micro gateway what port is the app listening on, right? So let's actually go and quickly try this app out. So we have two apps out here now, the SP1 2017 sample and the protected app, right? So now let's go fire a few requests over to the protected app. Okay, so here's the app. And it may appear like a very simple app that I'm just invoking right now. But watch what happens when I start to pepper request edit faster than the limit that I specified. The moment I start doing that, spike risk kicks in, right? Throws an error message, you can customize these things, but you can see it's limiting and controlling. This is just one example called spike rest as a policy shows up pretty, pretty, uh, pretty clearly. You could have used the OAuth policy, in which case if you do not supply an OAuth token, it will block access to the underlying app. Right? So you saw a very, very high level sample of how leveraging these technologies, you can actually put uh, a good amount of API management very, very transparently to sub uh, secure and manage your microservices. Okay, I'm going to shift back to the presentation. So 
If you just draw ourselves back from the demo here, what we really went through was a few things. We looked at how APIs and microservices are complementary, right? You look through a few different kind of uh, integrations that Apigee has been providing for uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry developers and operators, and we just uh, went through the latest uh, latest style of integration, which is using the decorator build pack, right? Within that kind of integration, the micro gateway is embedded inside of the container. It can scale with it. It now starts protecting your microservices at source and also pushing some pretty interesting analytics. Uh, we don't have, really have time to kind of go through all the analytics, but you can imagine, let uh, me see if I can just pull one thing real quick. Just see if, if it pops up real quick. So at least give you an idea of, okay, so here's an example of the different kind of visibility you will start getting across the different APIs, in which case the underlying microservices. You can build custom reports. This is a very sample API proxy performance report, but you can create custom reports very, very quickly and slice and dice the metrics the way you want it, right? So you get instant visibility into what's going on underlying with the uh, APIs. Okay, so this is a strategy which has actually worked. We spoke about, you know, how business as usual has to continue on, right? So as you're modernizing your apps into a platform like Cloud Foundry and building microservices, you can use API management as a strategy to be able to provide the much needed visibility into you know, what's really happening with the existing systems. So in this case, and this is a very simple example of a, uh, a joint customer, T-Mobile, who uses exactly this kind of a deployment architecture, where you have Apigee Edge in the front, and they are now beginning to use this new beta uh, decorator build pack that we just spoke about, right? They can delegate API management. You can get into some pretty interesting set of uh, patterns out here. But they are using this kind of a deployment architecture to A, power the business as usual as development teams are modernizing the applications as microservices, but more importantly, they get out of the box analytics to be able to answer and justify how much of traffic is really being served by the modern application versus legacy. And they're able to use those kind of decisions and insights to be able to you know, put more resources where they need to, right? I'm not sure how many folks out here got a chance to uh, attend the Verizon session. Uh, another example of a very good joint customer, uh, they had some pretty staggering numbers, right? I mean, obviously they're modernizing the apps and they're leveraging Apigee and Pivotal Cloud Foundry as a platform for the app modernization, but they saw 85 plus percent uh, improvement in time to market and more than 95 percent improvement in developer productivity, right? Because API management becomes a very cross-cutting concern, having a platform in place and having these prioritized integrations actually make it very, very easy and very productive for developers to start using them. Sure. Uh huh? Absolutely, yeah. So, yeah. So, follow up on that is, would it also include uh, in that So, I think you, you have to take a look at that at, uh, at a slightly higher level of abstraction. And what I mean by that is, think about that underlying microservice not as a microservice, but an API, right? So, let's say that microservice, that microservice itself may implement some kind of a circuit breaker. You could implement things of that nature even at the Apigee layer. You can absolutely do that. But think about this at more of a service composition use case, where I have one high-level API that I'm exposing, which comprises of three or four different microservices. So you can do that, but I think it'll be a choice on where it makes sense to do that, right? Okay, so I will, uh, sure. No, so I mean, if you're using this, doesn't necessarily try and integrate with you know Eureka itself. It gives you a deployment topology where the micro gateway can be used for you know the things that we went through, right? But I think I would encourage you guys to think about the difference between an API gateway and an API platform. The micro gateway is an instantiation of an API platform, giving you the ability to do traffic management, security for microservices, right? But it's part of a bigger platform, which means. Let's say you have a business level quota that you need to enforce. All of that can be declared and centrally managed within Apigee Edge and can be enforced through the micro gateway for all the API traffic, right? 
uh, you have the ability within Apigee platform to configure a set of APIs. Traditionally, what happens in an API program is once customers end up building APIs, they may start grouping certain APIs and provide those kind of packages, if you would, to certain kinds of audiences. They may say, I have a tiered partner program, right? So all those things in terms of being able to package APIs, providing those kind of uh, support for quota and other things can be done through the platform, right? And the analytics. Now, the thing running in the container is Microsoft. Is it a kind of sidecar or is it Yeah, so we went through three different models. It can be a sidecar, which we just, which is just what we looked at right now. Micro Gateway can also be deployed as an API, as a CS app by itself, in which case it becomes more of a proxy model to multiple microservices. So you have the choice on which one you want to use. Okay, so I'm going to round this thing up by the different benefits. I'm not going to go through each one of them, but I think you looked at a very high level how, for developers, it provides tools to be more productive, right? We have several customers that we have, you know, worked with who see benefits in that, uh, where if you have any cross-cutting concern, it could be some, something very custom, right? The custom plugin that we spoke about. You can insert that and pepper that across each and every app if you want to, just by including some of these constructs, right? So any horizontal concerns that you have, maybe you need to integrate with some other system to be able to enforce some subscription elements, or there's a check that you need to do across all the this becomes a very good model to be able to push all that through, right? Using the service broker constructs, developers can easily interact in a model that they're very used to within the Cloud Foundry semantics, right? For operators, especially the ones who are now managing Apigee Edge, let's say on-premises, through the Bosch installer, they're actually able to leverage some of the heuristics that we provide and deploy Apigee Edge, manage, maintain it through Bosch. It becomes very, very simple. So why don't we have Kenny back on the stage, we'll just kind of walk through some key takeaways. We covered a lot of ground, so let Kenny kind of start with the microservices piece. Yeah. Is it still on? Okay, yeah, so excellent presentation. Um, so a couple of thoughts there. So with the microservice architecture, one of the things you really have to be worried about as you modernize, as you're building these microservices and you're strangling that legacy system, is traffic, right? Uh, I've heard of horror stories from some customers who didn't have rate limiting, and they had all these new microservices, and they had all these new inbound requests to the legacy system, and down at the very bottom, they had a mainframe. And that mainframe became overloaded, right? And so they actually had to call IBM to bring up another core because their microservices were pounding that legacy system. Uh, so it's really important to, to build in protection to protect that layer because that's not a cloud native part of your, your architecture, right? You're building that cloud native part now and that scales horizontally, but as it scales horizontally, you still have to worry about traffic going to that legacy system. Great, so we also then, through the presentation, look through how APIs and microservices are complementary. Hopefully you'll start you know, connecting some of those pieces together where Yes, microservices has an API endpoint, but as that microservice starts to transcend some of the teams, departmental, and or enterprise boundaries, that API becomes a business contract. There's a plethora of apps and partner developers who are now suddenly consuming that. They expect that to be up and running, right? So in those instances, even though they're complementary, they need to be managed, right? And as customers are modernizing their infrastructure, Use API management as a strategy. It's been very effective with many other customers. Use that API management as a strategy to be able to support your app modernization efforts, right? So you're able to transition into that while supporting business as usual without causing too much pain on either side, right? So me and Kenny will be around to take any more questions. Yeah. Really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. And uh, thank you very much. Thank Enjoy you very the rest much. of your conference.